as a panelist uh, for the National Science Foundation, and he is the editor of many reputed journals. So without further ado, so the title of his talk is Bivariate Dimension Polynomials of Finitely Generated Modules Over Wild Algebras. So without further ado, I pass the baton to Professor Levine. Welcome, Alexander. Okay, thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm glad I'm here. Okay, so let me share the screen. Yeah, so you, you have to do the present now. And, and Stefan, uh, yeah, he's recording. Great. Is it okay? You can, can you see the... Yes, we can see your screen, yes. Great. Okay, so I'll be talking about uh, dimension bivariate dimension polynomials of modules of while algebras. Uh, this uh, topic appeared in 1971 when Bernstein introduced the theory of uh, modules over while algebras, and in particular, he proved the existence of Hilbert polynomial for such modules. Using his theory, Bernstein solved uh, Gelfand's uh, conjecture about meromorphic extensions of functions of this kind uh, from a positive uh, complex, uh, from, from half plane, half complex plane to the whole complex plane. So uh, what is uh, interesting here that it's one of the rare cases when pure algebraic theory has applications in analysis in uh, theory of functions. So we'll start uh, uh, introducing this theory. So uh, we consider uh, just a ring of polynomials, normal poly regular polynomials over a field of zero characteristics. And we consider partial derivations with respect to each of the n variables. D, di denotes as partial differentiation. And while algebra is simply a ring of differential operators over this ring R with these uh, derivations. So therefore, uh, elements of this, of this ring of this while algebra are linear combinations of power products of derivations with coefficients in R. Coefficients are polynomials. And therefore, as algebra, it is generated by these elements, X's and D's. And multiplication rule is given in natural way, so D's commute with each other as well as X's. But when you, when you multiply by DI by XJ, where I is not equal to J, then they commute, but if you multiply di xi, then they don't commute, they have this law of uh, commutation. And it, it's natural because it simply comes from product rule. If you apply this to some polynomial p, it's the same, you just use product rule. So this is non-commutative algebra, but it's almost commutative because the only thing that is not, uh, only elements that do not commute are those, di and xi. That's what is called wild algebra. And module over such algebra, they're also known as d modules. And there is a theory of d modules that what we are going to touch now. OK, so uh, elements of this kind are called monomials. And we will use multi-indices. So instead of writing x1 to alpha 1, etc., we will just write x to power alpha, meaning, uh, meaning this monomial. And similarly, d to power beta, uh, to power beta denotes this monomial. So therefore, you can just write x to alpha times d to beta for this, for this monomial. OK, and you, uh, of course, you multiply them as usual, because it, x's and d's separately constitute just uh, uh, commutative semi-groups. The only thing that the di does not commute with xi. Now, uh, if you have such n-dimensional vector, then uh, it's called the order or order of alpha. So like absolute value of sine of alpha is just sum of, of coordinates. And order of such a power product is just sum of uh, sum of uh, exponents, all, sum of all this exponent. 
it's uh, easy to prove that these monomials form a basis of this while algebra as a k-vector space. Uh, I, I would like to remind that they don't commute. So it, it's a theorem, it's not so obvious. However, it's not uh, hard to prove this. So every element of the of the while algebra can be written as such as such a linear combination of monomials. And the maximum order of monomials that appear here with non-zero coefficients is called the order of D. And of course, you have this natural property of order. So order of product is equal to sum of orders. And it allows us to consider natural increasing filtration of the while algebra. If you denote by WR, uh, denotes the set of all elements of while algebra whose order does not exceed R. And if R is negative, you just set WR to be zero. So therefore, you have ascending chain because the greater is R, the greater is WR. And <clears throat> so you have filtration. And if you have finitely generated module over the while algebra with these generators G1, GP, then uh, it can be naturally considered as a filtered uh, A and K module with natural filtration, just multiply elements of WR by, G, by generators. And it has this property. Um, and the union of MR, of course, is M. So it's so-called exhausting filtration. And for this uh, case, uh, Bernstein in 1971 proved the following theory. So with this notation, there exists a polynomial with the rational coefficients whose values describe the dimension of the component of filtration of finitely generated uh, module over while algebra. So uh, values, uh, uh, this is psi uh, m of t is a polynomial with the rational coefficients for all sufficiently large r, so starting with some r0 for all r, starting with some r0, we have this equality. Uh, moreover, a degree of this polynomial lies between n and 2n. n and 2n. n is number of uh, variables, in original variables. Now, if one writes this in this form, so that's polynomial of degree d, then degree d and this integer, so this is an integer, AD is a rational number, but when you multiply by D factorial, it's integer. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't depend on the system of generators, of generators of M. So it's, it's a characteristic of the module. So this is a polynomial associated with system of generators of a module that carries some numbers that do not depend on the choice of generators. So those are characteristics of modules. And there are two of them, d of m, degree of this polynomial, and e of m, the, this coefficient, uh, ad times d factorial. They are called Bernstein dimension and multiplicity of module m. And polynomial is called Bernstein polynomial of the module. And as you see, the minimum possible degree is n. And if it is really n, then such modules are uh, constitute so-called Bernstein class of, of modules over while algebra. They are also called holonomic D modules. And this is a theory that just uh, illustrates some properties of such modules. If you have uh, exact short, ex uh, not short, exact sequence of yeah, short exact sequence of, of modules, uh, then M two middle term belongs to Bernstein class, if and only if M1 and M3 are in this class. Moreover, uh, if M is in Bernstein class BN, then it has finite length. In, in fact, every strictly increasing sequence of A and K submodules contain at most that many elements. And uh, there are some relationship between uh, some uh, relationship between uh, this invariance. If M is any filtered model with increasing filtration, and you can find positive numbers, uh, integers A and B with this property, so dimension does not exceed this 
polynomial is UC of degree n in R. Then M belongs to Bernstein class, and you have this, um, this inequality for the multiplicity. So, therefore, we see that there are two invariants carried by Bernstein polynomial. By the way, uh, where, while algebra itself is interesting algebraic object, for example, it is known that it is simple in the sense that it does not have two-sided ideals. So there are some algebraic properties of wild algebra itself. Okay. So now, uh, for further, uh, we need uh, some information about uh, numerical polynomials in two variables. So polynomial in two variables is called numerical if it takes integer values for all sufficiently large inter integer values of arguments. So it means that there is a pair of integers such that whenever r is greater than r0 and s greater than s0, then f of rs belongs to z, its integer. Of course, if you have polynomial with integer coefficients, it is numerical polynomial, because of course, if you substitute integers, you still get integers. But uh, there are examples of uh, in, uh, numerical polynomials with non-integer coefficients like this. It's binomial. And you know this number is always integer, even though coefficient of t to the power k is 1 over k factorial, so it's not integer. Okay, so uh, this is the, um, th the theorem about representation of numerical polynomials. If you have numerical polynomial, say in two variables, and degree with respect to t1 is p and de uh, degree with respect to t2 is q, then such a polynomial can be always written as a combination of these binomials with integer coefficients. That's uh, the, the advantage of this representation, because those coefficients are integers, not rational numbers. So this is so-called canonical representation of numerical polynomial. So now we are going to use, in particular, this representation, and uh, Let's consider uh, polynomials associated with subsets of this set. So it's n denotes the set of all non-negative integers, including zero. If a is any subset of n, to m, m small and n small are just some positive integers, then a of rs will denote the set of all points in the set a, all such m plus n dimensional vectors with these properties. Some of first m coordinates does not exceed r, some of other coordinates does not exceed s. And then we introduce the following uh, set. Suppose you have subset of n to power m plus n, then v with index a denotes the set of all m plus n dimensional vectors, which are not greater or equal to any element of a with respect to the product order. Now, what is product order? It's partial order such that one vector less than another one if each coordinate of the first vector does not exceed uh, the corresponding coordinate of the second vector. It's not a total order. It's partial order. Because if you look at pair 1, 2 and pair 2, 1, none of them is greater with respect to product order. So, in other words, V belongs to this set VA if and only if for any element in A there is at least one coordinate that is greater than the corresponding coordinate of V. So, V consists of points which are not greater than any point of A with respect to the product order. And here is the theorem uh, I proved long ago with above uh, notation for any set A there is a numerical polynomial in two variables with this property. It describes the cardinality, the number of elements of this set VA of RS. So it's elements of, this is a set of elements of VA, uh, such that or first, some of first, uh, first M coordinates does not exceed R, some of other coordinates does not exceed S. Degree of this polynomial does not exceed M plus N, 
and degree with respect to T1 less than or equal to N, degree with respect to T2 less than or equal to N, and the degree is equal to M plus N, the maximum possible degree, if and only if the set A is empty, and in this case, it, the polynomial is this. And it is zero or if and only if point zero belongs to the set A. It's called M and dimension polynomial of this set. Now, methods and algorithm of computing this polynomial, and even a direct formula can be found in our first book in 1999, Differential and Difference Dimension Polynomials. Okay, so now we are going to uh, start uh, obtaining generalization of Bernstein theorems. So, first of all, we consider the set of monomials as before. And the same thing, we, uh, order of, the, of such a monomial with respect to X and with respect to D. So, order with respect to X and order with respect to D are defined as some of the corresponding exponents for X's and for D's. And order, total order of theta is just sum of this two. And uh, for any uh, theta of R comma S, if R and S are uh, natural numbers, denotes the set of all elements of theta whose orders do not exceed R and S respectively with respect to X and D. And if you have such a, uh, such a uh, monomial, such a power product, then theta with index X denotes X part of this monomial and theta with index D, D part of this monomial, D to power beta. Uh, clearly, if you consider a set of all theta X's, so only powers of X, or only powers of D, those are commutative uh, multiplicative semi-groups. But of course, the theta is not. I remind you that X and D, generally speaking, they don't commute. So it's not a, a commutative semi-group. Now, if you have element of a while algebra, then the order of D with respect to X and similarly with respect to D, uh, those orders are defined as maximum orders of, of, of element D, of this element D capital, with respect to X and D. And this notion allows us to consider while algebra as a bifilter ring. So we have bifiltration. So with two indices, so it can uh, elements of W with double index RS consists of all uh, elements D from the while algebra whose order orders with respect to X and D do not exceed R and S respect. And if at least one of these numbers, Rs, is negative, then Wrs is zero. And of course, union of all this element, all, all this Wrs is the whole while algebra. And you have this increasing sequence with respect to each of, of two indices if you fix the other one. So you have this inclusion if you fix X, and you have this inclusion if you, have, if you fix R. And of course, you have this. If you have uh, if you have positive uh, indices, then you have this inclusion, of course. Okay. Now, next thing we consider, we consider ordering on the set of all monomials. So we consider a set of such monomials, and we consider two orderings: one with the index x, the other with the index d. With, with, when you compare monomials with respect to index X, then first you compare order with respect to X. So you, like X plays the main role here. Then you compare order with respect to D and then other exponents. That's how you define order with respect to X. Order with respect to D is defined in a similar way, but first you compare orders with respect to D and then order with respect to X, and then other, other exponents. And the exponents, as you see, of D in this case, this exponents of betas, are more important in some sense than exponents of X. They go first to compare lexical graphic. Okay. 
Now, for this uh, monomials, we also make, uh, can consider the concept of division. Uh, what does it mean that theta divides theta prime? It simply means that x part of theta divides x part of theta prime, and d part of theta divides uh, d part of, of uh, theta prime. So it means the corresponding exponent, each correspond, each exponent in the first monomial is less than or equal than the corresponding exponent in the second monomial. And also we say in this case that theta prime is a multiple of theta, and right theta divides theta prime. Now, uh, remember that uh, we don't have commute, uh, so elements do not commute, and therefore uh, when you write theta theta prime, imagine you, you have this monomial and you multiply by this one. If you want to write answer in the same form, so x is go, go first, and then these. You have to, you cannot just switch there. You have this product plus some terms of smaller degree, of smaller order. So in this case, this part is denoted by theta theta prime with bar. So it's like main part of the product. Product contains some other terms with lower degrees. So it means that if theta divides theta prime, then theta prime can be written as such a product, minus, and those are terms of smaller degrees. And uh, sum of orders theta zero and theta is or, uh, with respect to x and d is equal to the corresponding orders of the, uh, theta prime. This is just example. Say theta is there is x d square, it divides x square d cube, of course. But it, the ratio is not just x d, like if, if they commute. Because uh, you can write this way, but you have some remainder, theta 1 here. Because there is no commutativity. Okay, and the least common multiple uh, is element which is least common multiple, uh, product of least common multiple of each part of theta. So least common multiple of x part times least common multiple of d part. Okay, so that's what we have for monomials in the Weyl algebra. And now let's consider finitely generated free module over such algebra. So those are free generators. And this is just module generated by this element. So in other words, it's a vector space over field k generated by all such elements. So you take generators and multiply by various monomials from Weyl algebra. Such elements are called terms. And for any term, we define the order of a term like as order of theta. So it's the same as order of theta with respect to x or order of theta with respect to d. Here they are. And if t is any subset of theta, then t times e denotes the set of all such terms. And in particular, if you take this set, which is set of all monomials whose order with respect to x does not exceed r1 and order with respect to d does not exceed r2, then uh, this is notation for the set, for this set, theta ei, uh, where orders of theta with respect to x and y do not exceed r1 and r2 respectively. And uh, the same notation for uh, terms as we had for, uh, uh, for monomials in while algebras, if you have a term, and then you can multiply this term by element of theta capital, so you can write this way, plus the sum of some terms with, of this kind where, uh, where theta wave here a smaller order with respect to x and y than, than this leading, leading part of the product. The same thing as before. And this leading part will be denoted by this. Okay, so now uh, let's consider a typical element of the space E. Typical element of the space E with generator with, is of this form. So it is some linear combination of, of terms with coefficients in k. 
Now, when you have one term and you have another term, then when we say, we say that um, u is a multiple of v, is first of all, when a term is a multiple of another term, uh, when i equals j, so they should have the same generator, and uh, theta divides theta prime. Then we say that v divides u, and write this as fraction. And again, uh, when we divide, we can single out the leading part. And least com common multiple is defined in the same way as in Weyl algebra, except for if uh, you have terms with different generators, then it, uh, at least common multiple is zero. You cannot take uh, non get non-zero least common multiple if i is not equal to j. Okay. We can also extend our orders. Remember, we had orders of uh, on term of the set of uh, on the set of terms in while algebra. We can extend this to the terms to the orders of terms in free module. So we say that this term is smaller than this one than theta prime e, e j. If we first compare actually theta and theta prime. You see, it's exactly like uh, we start like uh, comparing uh, mo uh, monomials in Weyl algebra, but then we put i here, this number of uh, 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 number of the generator, and similar here is j, and compare this vector lexical graphically. So still, if theta is less than theta prime with respect to x, then uh, you have still this inequality. If you, if order with respect to x theta is smaller than order with respect to x theta prime, then you have this inequality. And the same thing for d. Okay, now if you write your polynomial f in this form, in this form, so those, we assume that a1, as are not zeros, because we just drop zero terms. If you write your element in this form, then uh, the greatest with respect to order x term in this representation is called x leader of f. And greatest with respect to d term is called d leader. And lc of, uh, with index x and lc with index d uh, of f denote uh, coefficients of this leading, leading terms in the representation too. So now what we are going to do is to consider a reduction. So uh, it's uh, the same uh, idea as idea behind the Grobner basis when we consider reduction. Or if you go back to high school mathematics, it's division of polynomials. So how you divide polynomials? You try to eliminate leading term of a polynomial. So then you, you, you subtract then you try to do, uh, eliminate leading term of the next polynomial, etc. So this is the same idea. So we say that f is x d, d reduced with respect to g. If it does not contain a multiple of, of leader of, uh, of g, f does not contain, you see, I put bar because when you divide, you, can, you might have uh, some uh, elements of lower degrees. So this is the main part of the core, uh, uh, main part uh, that you obtain when you multiply. So f is reduced, xd reduced with respect to g if it does not contain multiple of x leader of, uh, of g such that the order of the d leader will be multiplied by t does not exceed the order of d leader of f. So why, uh, so this is a extra condition. And the idea behind this is that uh, you want to eliminate highest term when you divide, like you divide polynomials. But at the same time, you don't want to increase the d leader because you might subtract in general, you might subtract some power some uh, multiple of, of, uh, of ug, but at the same time, you might increase the other leader. So this reduction is so delicate that you eliminate highest, 
highest term with respect to x, but at the same time, you don't increase the order with respect to d. And we say that f is xd reduced with respect to a set of elements, if it is xd reduced with respect to every element. And the reduction, how we actually reduce, like division, is defined as follows. So we, we say that f reduces with respect to xd to some polynomial h using g. So it's actually you divide f by g, and this is like a remainder at the first stage. If f contains some term with coefficient, non-zero coefficient, that divides w, some term w, so it contains W such that leader of G divides, X leader of G divides W. And you see, well, this is subtraction. This is a step of division, like you eliminate highest term, in such a way that you don't increase the order with respect to D. So this uh, rule is just rule of division. And uh, if you do this several times, so we say that element f reduces to h uh, with, with respect to this set of, of elements, g capital. If there is a sequence of such reductions, so you can find several elements from, from the set g, so the chain of reductions eventually gives you remainder, element which is reduced with respect to f. And uh, this is theorem that says that you can always do this. You can always take element f, and uh, you can rearrange this so you subtract this linear combination of g's, of elements of g capital, and obtain element g small, which is reduced with respect to g. g is reduced with respect to g capital. So uh, this reduction is always possible. And this is algorithm for such reduction that just so it can be realized in, say, Maple, for example. Uh, I'll not go over the steps. The idea is just to use that reduction uh, that I showed before. OK, so now we can give a definition of Grobner XD Grobner basis, a generate, uh, generalization of classical concept of Grobner basis. So we need, uh, formally we consider a new symbol and consider such monomials with additional power of this symbol Z. And uh, consider T to be set of, uh, we consider it before, it's set of terms. And, but terms now are of this form. And we say that T, one term divides another term if I equals J and t divides t prime in this uh, in this uh, uh, set of power products. So it means that theta divides uh, the divide uh, theta one divides theta two, and uh, z to k divides z to l. So k less than or equal to l. So it's natural division of monomials. And then for every element of the free module E, we consider this difference. As you see, this difference is always positive or, or zero, greater than or equal to zero, because this is the leader with respect to D. And this is leader with respect to X. So, of course, order with respect to D of the leader with respect to D is greater than or equal than the corresponding order with respect to D of some other term, which is X leader. So this is non-negative number. And then for any F, you can consider this formally this term, z to this degree, positive degree, n times leader of f with respect to x. And we say that if you have n is a n, n of k submodules of free n k module e, then finite set is in this module e is called Grobner basis for n. So it's a set, a subset of n. If any non-zero for any non-zero element f in n, you can find gi in this set such that rho of gi divides rho of f. So this 
definition looks a little a bit, a bit artificial, but it fully corresponds to the reduction we considered before. And that's what it allows us to prove the following theorems that actually justify the existence, uh, justify the theory of such basis. So finite set. Uh, now, if you, if you don't have some concrete sub module and you just have some elements of the of the module E, then it, it is said to be X D Grobner basis if and only if it's Grobner basis of the module generated by these elements. So it's just uh, the Grobner basis of the element generated by this element G. And here is the main property of such basis. It is X D Grobner basis of submodule N. Suppose we have such a basis, then F belongs to N if and only if it reduces to zero. So it means that it doesn't matter how you divide F by elements of G in any order, the result, uh, it reduces to zero, the remainder is zero. And if F is in N and it is reduced with respect to G, it can happen only if F is zero. So it gives you, so if you can find Grobner basis of, uh, of a module, then you actually can solve membership problem. You can uh, say, uh, you can solve the following problem. Does F belong to, to the module N? It's very uh, simple procedure. You just divide F by Grobner basis. If the remainder is zero, then it belongs to E. If the remainder, remainder is not zero, it does not belong to, e, to N. Okay, and now, uh, so the, the main problem, how to construct Grobner basis. And here we can prove a uh, generalization of famous Buchberger algorithm that allows us to construct Grobner basis of any module over while algebra. So we introduce this so-called S polynomials with respect to X. It's kind of S polynomials that we consider in classical Grobner basis theory. So if you look at this, you see that uh, you can introduce least common multiple of, of leading terms, then divide by leading term and multiply by F. This procedure eliminates the highest term. It's like you take least common multiple of two leading monomials, and then using this least common multiple, you just multiply them by the corresponding factor, subtract, and the, the result has a degree smaller than, than the degree of each of the elements you subtract. So, and the, using this, uh, this as polynomials, we can prove this criterion. So if you, uh, suppose you have Grobner basis with respect to D. This is classical Grobner basis and it is known how to construct it. There is, there are many algorithms how to construct it. So we can construct Grobner basis with respect to D. Then, we take S polynomials with respect to X and reduce with respect to G. Every time you reduce, if, we, if all of them are reduced to zero, then this is X D Grobner basis. If not, then the same procedure as in classical case. Suppose you divide S polynomial by G and the remainder is not zero. Then you add this remainder to your original Grobner basis G. So you, you increase number of elements. Then you repeat this procedure again until all S polynomials are reduced to zero. And it can be proven it, it, uh, that this process terminates, so it's finite process. And this is algorithm, a very short algorithm that realizes this, realizes this uh, theory. Okay, and this is just example. So you have two polynomials, and you construct S polynomial, you have to add uh, extra polynomial because this is S, uh, S polynomial, this G1 and G2. And so finally you get Grobner basis consisting of these three elements. Okay, and uh, this, uh, the last part of this talk is about uh, by very dimension polynomials. So we still have double filtration of file algebra 
And if you have module, finitely generated module, or simply module over while algebra, you can consider bifiltration, so double filtration, with two indices, with the same uh, with the same uh, properties. So you have increasing chain with respect to each each variable. If you fix one of the of the index, index indices, then you have increasing sequence with respect to the other index. Union of M R S is M, and you have this inclusion that is natural for any filtration. And here we have this theorem that says that if M is finitely generated module, not necessarily a free module, any module, with this system of generators, then you can take free module E, a natural epimorphism of modules, so that EI goes to FI. And if you take kernel of this natural mapping and construct Grobner basis in this uh, kernel N, and if U R S for any R and S denotes the set of all terms in free modules, whose order with respect to D does not exceed, uh, whose orders do not exceed R and S, and it's either a multiple of leader of element of G I, or uh, it's even it's either it's not a multiple or it is multiple, but in this case, you have this inequality that if you remember forbidden when you make reduction. When you make reduction, this thing should be, should have order less than or equal to S. If you have consider this set URS, so either uh, terms which are not multiples of X leaders of GIs, or that are multiples but with bad situation with D, with order with respect to D then this set is the basis of the space of MRS. And our previous results allow us to compute number of elements in this pi of URS. And we can prove this main result. So with the above uh, notation, we can, there is a polynomial, numerical polynomial in two variables that describes the dimension of MRS components of the double filtration. This polynomial has degree at most n with respect to t1 and t2, and so total degree is less than or equal to 2n. And therefore it can be written in this form with the integer coefficients. It's called xd dimension polynomial. So uh, if, you, if you compare with Bernstein theorem, it's, uh, here we have a polynomial in two variables uh, rather than one variable. The main uh, difference is the following. If you have this polynomial in two variables, then if you consider all uh, pairs ij, this indices of these coefficients, which are not zero, and consider, uh, so there are elements of n squared, and consider maximum elements of this set with respect to either lexicographic or reverse lexicographic order. So you can either natural lexicographic order or just vice versa. You start from the right to left. Then degree of this polynomial, coefficient a and n, mu and nu, so this vectors, and the corresponding coefficients do not depend on the system of generators. So you see this polynomial carries many more invariants than Bernstein polynomial. And uh, let's illustrate this with final, uh, final examples. So here you have module generated by one generator F with this defining equation. So it means this is factor module of the free module by this element. And in this case, uh, this is XD dimension polynomial, here it is. And this is Bernstein polynomial. As you see, Bernstein polynomial carries two invariants, degree, which is one, and this coefficient A plus B, this is multiplicity. This bivariate dimension polynomial, if you, uh, according to the last theorem, carries the following invariants, A plus B, coefficient of T1, and A, and all, of course, degree one. So this polynomial gives you all parameters, A plus B and A. So it fully de defines 
parameters of this defining equation. Uh, while uh, Bernstein polynomials gives you only this parameter, a, pl a plus b is invariant. So it's essential advantage. And uh, the last thing I want to show that this uh, the uh, bivariate dimension polynomial can serve as a solution for solution of so-called isomorphism problem. So you have two modules over while algebras. You want to see whether they are isomorphic. Let's look at this. Consider two modules. Um, M1 is cyclic model generated by M1. This is by M2. And these are defining equations. So M1 satisfies this equation, M2 satisfies this equation. So you, and again, you can treat them as factor modules of three modules, but by the corresponding modules generated by two elements. In this case, Bernstein polynomials in both cases, they are equal, and here it is, 2t plus 1 is Bernstein polynomial for first and second module. So therefore, you cannot distinguish them. However, if you compute bivariant dimension polynomial, in the first case, you have 2t plus 2, and in the second case is this. You see here invariance 1 and 1, coefficients of t1 and t2. Here, zero coefficient of t1 and two coefficient of t2. So clearly, they are not isomorphic. So the computing of these polynomials allows us to solve this isomorphism problem, okay? I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. And uh, for such a wonderful talk. So any questions, anyone? Yes, uh, I have one question, uh, Sasha. So you yeah. know what is meant by the Grobner fan of an AN module? What is meant by Grobner fan? Yeah, yeah, I understand. I, I, I never worked with Grobner fan, so okay. I, I, yeah, unfortunately, I, I know what, uh, vaguely what is this, but uh, but I, I, I didn't work with Grobner fan. Sorry about this. Yeah, I, I just you know you can generalize these things. What I talked about, of course, to any partition of any set of gener of any uh, of uh, of this of any set of variables. You see here we have by by varied polynomial. You have axes and d's, but you can also break axes in pieces, and can break d's in pieces, and then you have multivariate polynomial. But this is just direct generalization of this. Sorry, I I, I don't know much about your offense. Is this work implemented in software? Uh, is there a software on which these algorithms ca are implemented? Uh, it is under development. Okay. okay. <laughs> it is not ready yet. Yes. Yeah, but the principle it should work, and so algorithm is clear, but it is not realized yet. So, as yet, there have not been any examples of uh, simple modules. Uh, because um, the classification of simple modules of our while algebra that is, is not yet fully accomplished. Uh, it is yeah. only, I mean, it has, there have been advances in the recent past, but not fully done, as you said, because only the Bernstein's invariance, original invariance, they, right. only they, are, they are being used. It's not anything finer than that which is being used. So, yeah. I was asking. As in software, then it is easy to work with the software and then calculate whether two simple modules are isomorphic or not. Absolutely, yeah, that's a very important problem. And I believe that uh, this uh, these ideas can help because, as I said, you can also break axes and d's in parts and compare, in, and you have more invariance in this case. You can even break uh, in such a way that you have only one variable in each group x1, x2, etc. And you have uh, more invariance. So in this case, you can uh, decide whether modules are not isomorphic yet. So what about the cases nowadays, there are quantized versions of these while algebras. So uh, are you, uh, you, you're you not aware of that, I believe. 
The quantized yeah. version uh -huh. means that if you replace the, for example, the x variables, uh, they will not commute, but they will quasi commute. Yes, so, I know. It's, uh, now it's called sir, a Rode algebra or something. Uh, yeah, 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 I mean, Andrew so, Rode algebra. So, yeah, yeah. Actually, you know what? You can do the same thing there. You have more complicated um, law of com uh, commutation, but in no, no. Uh, what I mean is, that if you look at the ordinary polynomial algebra, just ordinary commuting variables, okay. then yeah. there is a notion of Hilbert polynomial for that also. No, but in this case, you have polynomial of degree one. If you have one variable. No, no, no. Suppose there are n variables. Okay. And uh, then, I mean, if you are working with such algebras where there are n variables, they are commuting, then you have the notion of Hilbert polynomial. But yes. my question is that your method of, you know, having this, uh, I mean, uh, by, I mean uh, this pi uh, by, by polynomial, yeah. so it will uh, work for the case uh, because suppose what happens if the variables are just quasi commuting and there are no differential operators there are no differential operators only x variables are there but they are quasi commuting then it can then anything can be deduced along these lines but because there you don't have two different i mean classes of variables here we have x variables and the differential uh, differentiation operators so and we are taking this uh, pi polynomial with respect to these two different ones. Okay. But if you have only one class of variables, then I think that you cannot do that. You cannot take uh, two different. Uh, I mean, if, if, what is the law of commute, uh, commutation? If say, say for yeah, example, this was two polynomials. Yes, quasi commuting. Something like uh, some scalar of commute. Something like uh, I mean, if you take the I mean, um, for the while algebra, for example, if you take the exponentials of the um, elements, then you get the relation, this uh, quantum commutation relation. Uh -huh. So okay, suppose so, the. Okay, I can tell you exactly. If you have commutation law such that the leading terms remain the, has the same order, so say for example x times y is y times x plus something which is has lower order any commut a commutation law of this kind then it would work okay, okay. so you see so it's commuting up to up to terms of lower orders then the same ideas work of course if you have a non commutative case then it doesn't work yes Yes, but uh, I mean, uh, okay. So, are there any references you would suggest for this work, for uh, for you know, referring to this material in your talk? Yeah, I I I, I can send out uh, some papers that I wrote on these topics. Uh, I, I don't have it at oh. hand, but I, I I'll send. I I, I can send Sudeshna and uh, she can share you. Absolutely, I can do that. No yes. problem. Thank you. Okay, Rabia, you wanted to ask some questions, right? Uh, yeah. Mm. Yes. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yeah, you are. are. Yes, you yeah, are. Yeah. Audible. Okay, uh, so basically in the division algorithm, uh, when we do the reduction, we get a nice matrix representation. Uh, basically, uh, it is a process of multiplication by elementary matrices, uh, and the product of that matrices will be minus one to the power some power. So here also you are doing some kind of reduction. So my question is whether by fixing a basis we can also get some kind of uh, nice matrix representation. Mm, let's see. Yes, you can. Yes, you can have matrix representation with matrices. Some, yeah. So th there is approach with matrices here yeah, with integer entries. 
Yes, you can. So in our first book, uh, this uh, that what I mentioned in 1999, you can find uh, re representation of subsets of n to the m as matrices. And the algorithm that uh, uses, uh, uses matrices. And it's very efficient, actually. That you are right. Working with matrices in this sense is, is, is awarding you, yeah. When you deal with subsets of n to them, so it, it, it helps in such algorithms, right? So I, I didn't go into this, but uh, one can refer to its second chapter of our book. That's what uh, in 1999. You can take a look. There are a lot of algorithms when uh, it, uh, the uh, subset of n to the m and the related uh, related terms are represented as matrices. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, and second question is that you said that it, these type of things uh, are helpful for uh, mem membership ideal membership problems. Uh, yes. So. I would like to know you meant for affine cases or projected cases. Mm, let's see. Yeah, I think so. If, if you solve membership uh, problem for ideals, then you can switch to varieties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I, I believe it. it, it useful for okay you can uh, associate uh, polynomial with in two variables like Hilbert polynomial all right you can associate with certain varieties yeah uh, the same thing can be done with uh, dimension polynomial in two and maybe more variables it depends how you break your basic uh, basic variables yes absolutely yes and uh, yes you can do this for, for varieties as well yes yeah Sure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. So let's thank the speaker one more time. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha, for a wonderful talk. And thanks, everyone, for being here. And we hope to see you soon for our next colloquium. We'll put out the announcement soon. Thank you. So, Stefan, uh, yeah. thank you, Sasha. Okay, thank you all for the interesting talk. And um, yeah, then see you soon again. <laughs> see you soon, everyone. Take care. Stay okay. safe. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.